Who is the secret cult that's running the world? It's Sabatee and Frankus, Peter. What the hell is that, Tracy? I don't know. Maybe let's Wikipedia it. I heard it somewhere. I'm not sure where, but... Oh. Oh, look. Well, there's this guy, Sabatai Zevi. Um, And uh, he appears to be a... uh, Now, he lived in the 1600s, so that's the 15th century, right? I always get that. Or is the... Or is it this? Yeah. Or no, is it's it the fifteenth century? Right? Is it? Or is yeah, it? Yes, because we're living in the twenty-first century, but it's the year two thousands. Okay, so add one. All right, because yeah. the first century was zero to a hundred. It it's it's like it always confuses me, and, <laughs> and I know that like when children are born in China, I think they're they're born at one years old or something. Or so they're stealing anyway, a year from you, or we a, we have an extra one that we're just not counting. It's it's all confusing, but but anyway. So this guy Sabatai Zevi was a guy who, uh, well, he would. I have to use all of these things in like air quotes, but he was he was a a, a claim. He claimed he was a Jewish Messiah. Let's yeah. just say he claimed he was a Jewish right. Messiah. And at the time when he did this, there was a lot of tumult in Europe, in European Jewry. And we don't know if we're going to get thrown off of YouTube for this, just so everybody knows. We're not trying to be offensive. We're just trying to set, share the history. That's right. And it, and, and, uh, it was actually the uh, Ottoman Empire, I believe. or the was um, born into. That, uh, Ottoman or Holy Rome? No. No, it was the Ottomans. It was Ottoman. The, he was born in Turkey. Yeah, Ottoman Empire. And, uh, and, and this so, is on the heels of the Inquisition. So this is why everybody's feeling kind of down. Okay. And uh, and he claimed that he was uh, the Messiah, that uh, he was the guy who was going to lead the uh, the tribes back to to uh, the Holy Land, to Israel, and rebuild the temple. And um, but he had some kind of odd uh, ideas about uh, the way to to make that happen. And uh, yeah. there's a there's a lot about it. you know you and I had uh, talked about this uh, video with uh, David Ike. Uh, that we had watched, uh, where David Icke kind of goes into that, and uh, he he talks a lot about it in uh, in this book, The Trigger, uh, which I bought a long time ago, and I just started reading after I started uh, doing this, and I realized that he has a a, a, a lot of information on Sabbatian, Sabbat Zevi and the uh, Satanic cult, uh, as he calls it, uh, that they're that he's running, and uh, and this is uh, his description of how Sabbatean, the Sabbatean cult works. Uh, the Sab- Sabbatai Zevi's cult sought to usurp traditional Judaism and literally invert everything it stood for. A day of fasting became a day of feasting, for example. Traditional religious teachings and laws, sexual taboos, and the concept of right and wrong were all turned on their head as Zevi advocated that doing evil was to be encouraged and celebrated without guilt. Scholars have referred to this as transvaluation within the Jewish culture, turning accepted norms on their heads and promoting a belief that the violation of the sacred became a sacred duty. Do not kill became do kill. And a Sabbatean prayer was blessed be they who permit the forbidden. Redemption through sin was the sales pitch, but it was really just a scam to spread the hidden hand religion of what we call Satanism. Sabbatean belief was founded on the concept that being evil implodes evil, and so the more evil there is, the quicker it's imploded. So that's uh, Ike's description. And uh, apparently he was, uh, he was quite popular. I think that he had about a million followers. Uh, that's what I picked up in several places. So. I know we kind of spread out on this one. And so I found Christopher Hitchens has a chapter on him in his God is not great book. Okay. Very short. And he doesn't get into any of his teachings at all. He just kind of pays homage to him as one of these fake messiahs, as he calls them. And he said, he thinks that he had close to a million people following him at the time. You got to remember the world population was not all that large back then. So that's huge. It, it, it was big. And, um, uh, just a sidebar note, I um, I realized that you know we're we're coming really close to the third rail in uh, in having this uh, conversation today. So we're t- 
to all of those YouTube people out there, we're, we're doing our, our best to be uh, objective about all of this stuff. So yeah. we're not, we're, we're catching everything as this is what somebody said. This is what we read. And uh, we're leaving it up to our audience to come to their own conclusions. That is correct. So you might be wondering, how did this guy that seems kind of crazy pick up this following? And he was really well studied in the Torah. And this is, there had been a, um, a resurgence of the Kabbalistic teachings at this time. There was a new Kabbalah that was put out or Kabbalistic study the by a guy named Loria. Loria. Yeah, Loria. Yes. And so he kind of picked up on that. But there were rabbis that they said in Robert Seffer's book, 1666, which is what started both of us down this road. He mentions that rabbis from all over the place were saying Zevi was coming to them in dreams and stuff like this. So they started to believe all of his, um, you know, messianic claims. And right. then he had a hype man, I guess you would call him, this guy that he met, Nathan of Gaza, he was called, that seemed to like run around with him and blow up his stuff and be like, yep, this is the dude. His disciple. Yes. Who thought he was also prophesized as well. And he's the one that convinced Sevi to, to announce his messiahship or whatever. And they do it on June the 18th, 1666. So June is the sixth month. The 18 is three times six. And then one six, six, six. So you can see all that fun numerology because the Loria Kabbalah really started off the, the big kick for, I guess, gematria and reading numbers into words and all those kind of things too. That's where that started. It, it's where it got popularized. Cause you're thinking this is the printing press is now the new hot thing. So this stuff mm -hmm. can get spread all around, but the Loria Kabbalah really introduced the world to this idea of, I, I guess, or the Jewish world in, into looking into Gematria and the significance of numbers. And that's why he chose that day to make his announcement. Yep. And, uh, and so he became really, uh, popular, um, uh, uh, and apparently that his, uh, his doctrine, uh, sounded like the, uh, hedonistic lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> well, and I listened to, there's a rabbi, his name is Marvin Antelman mm -hmm. and he's written two books, one called, they're both called that to eliminate the opiate volume one and volume two. And he wrote the first volume, I think in the early seventies. And I listened to a, um, an interview he did because he's put out a second volume in 2018 following this. And he really dug into Sabotage Zevi because I went and looked on YouTube and there's some kind of apologistic things where they just whitewash over his teachings. It's just like, oh, yeah, here's his bio. He was this guy. He claimed he was a messiah. A bunch of people followed him, blah, 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 blah. He ends up, we'll wrap up his life story, but they kind of close it out. Nothing about what he was teaching. But this guy was saying, that he was so Zabatai was so well studied in the Talmud that there's teachings inside of there that says the Messiah will come when everybody's either really when everybody is good or when everybody is bad. And Zabatai looked at that and said, Well, it's, we're never going to have everybody good, but right, maybe so, we can get everybody bad. <laughs> so, so he's an accelerationist, correct? And it, uh, it's a good sell, right? Like, Look, guys, we're never going to get rid of people that are going to rape and steal and kill and all these kind of things. So well, ex except except for the murder part and the, you know, the pedophile part and the, you know. Yes. I, no, 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 no. But I'm saying that's how you make the cell. If we want the Messiah to come back, we either all have to behave in a godly way. Right. Which we know is not possible because we've got these outliers who are going to steal and rape and kill. So if we all do those things, then the Messiah will come. But didn't he say that he was the Messiah? See, that's, that's the I'm... confusing part. I don't understand. I mean, I guess that you know the Kabbalists say that there's a, a Kabbal there's a Messiah of every age, right? There's, or or, or at least that's the the. Well, I think uh, it was God would actually make his presence known and come back, right? And start talking to everybody again. So, so anyway, so so he became very popular. And uh, it turned out that the Sultan of uh, well, Turkey... Well, they chased him out of, of Israel, or Palestine okay. at the time, I suppose. They were like, the rabbis there were not having this. Right. And so he went back to... It's like they, they did the been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to... Uh, I mean, he was saying, violate all of the dietary rules. If, there, you know, if there's a day of fasting, it's now a day of feasting. They was doing... It was, almost sounds like eyes wide shut. Parties were going on 
Yeah, wife yeah. swapping, kid diddling. I mean, it's just all the most horrible things we think about that are going on potentially today. That gets uh, your Kathy O'Brien world. Right, and that's that's part of the reason that we're talking about that. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting when you start researching anything uh, in this kind of uh, occult or uh, conspiracy world. Uh, you you keep tunneling back. Things keep going back, and it seems like uh, all roads lead to sabotage Evy in this conspiracy world. Um, a lot of the a lot of the things that are going on today with you know the the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers or the Council on Foreign Relations or the Round Table Cecil Rhodes Round Table, it all seems to uh, link back uh, to this stuff, and that's why we're talking about it today because the uh, the things that you're talking about are the things that are very much of the moment. These are the rumors that you know swirl around. Uh, you know you can you can categorize it as Pizzagate or Q conspiracy theories, but or a lot Epstein, of it, the or real, Ep, or you know, Eps, or the Epstein, that, yeah, the legitimized that, one. Yeah. Bill, <laughs> and Bill, there's a, I saw a picture of Bill Gates with Epstein yesterday. I know. I saw, somebody said that that's his new t uh, Tinder profile pic. <laughs> I think that was Luke Krakowski <laughs> memed that. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, so it's very, it's very of the moment. It, t it turns out as you start to kind of dig in, uh, connect the dots here a little bit, but he became really popular. And uh, when he became really popular, he, uh, he got kicked out of Israel, like you said, and made his way to a Andalusia. Is that what they were calling Turkey back then? Oh, no, well, the way that Sefer calls it is Western Anatolia. A Anatolia, that's right. Yes. And uh, and then the Sultan noticed him, this uh, yeah. re really popular guy, and he, ga <laughs> and he gave him a choice. And well, the he let him chill for a while. He's like, all right, yeah. we'll take the tourism, you know? Right, and and they probably could. Kill it. There's a, a a tax, right? If you're in a Muslim country and you don't, you're not a Muslim, then you just pay the sh taria. Is it? I don't can't know. Remember, can't remember what it's called. Somebody I'm sure they that. were making money. They monetized it, and then he got sick of him. Um. Uh, Dave Underdown says, "I am Damos disappeared." Did it? I don't know. We'll have to go check that out. We'll have to go check that out. Um. That would be interesting if it did. Because <laughs> uh, uh, did we? I didn't get a notice. Did you get a notice? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, so uh, so he became popular, and the uh, the sultan uh, told him that he had a choice, which is that he could put on the hat or lose his head. I think, and what he meant was put on the or put on the turban, or lose his head, which meant that. Uh, uh, he could either convert to Islam or he could be beheaded. And apparently he converted to Islam. But shortly after that, he kind of disappeared from, from history. Um, and, and, th and that leads to this, this whole... Uh, well, he was around. That's not the end of the story because this is from 1666. Okay. Zephyr's book, but which when, I, I will when, link in the notes. Hmm. But when did he have to... Uh, convert what year was that i don't know that he gives a year of the conversion yeah so the way that i read the story and i could be wrong fact check me everybody is that um uh he converted uh and then uh what he what he told people after he converted was that that he was a a, a crypto muslim mm -hmm. that that he was yeah that was he, the story he told the sultan that he was a muslim and he went out and he overtly practiced his Muslim uh, religion, but uh, uh, covertly, uh, he was still a Sabbatean. Uh, uh, he was a Sabbatean. Yes. Yes. And that led him to urge people to convert to other religions uh, as need be, uh, but to never let go of their Sabbateanism. Um, and that, I wrote this down. Uh, uh, that philosophy is called uh, donma, donma. It's Arabic, uh, and it means to turn, right? So you're somebody who's turned um, overtly, uh, but covertly you haven't turned. Um, you're still the same old, same old. So um, uh, 
the reason that that starts to become interesting is because that becomes the reoccurring theme for the taking over of other secret societies like the Masons later on, uh, the Jesuits, the um, uh, and then uh, things like uh, uh, foundations, uh, tax-free foundations like uh, Carnegie Institute or Rockefeller Foundation. Although those th it's arguable whether or not those are compromised, but uh, obviously the United States government, if you look at the Edward Mandel House slash uh, Antonio Gramsci model of you know usurping from inside um, starts to manifest itself. Uh, but we need to bring in the new character in order to kind of bridge those those things. So, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about 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 Sabatai Zevi before we bridge? Well, I'm trying to find the the piece in in Zephyr's 1666 which again, I'll link in the show notes and it is up on the site. But he, when he converted, he was pretty well accepted by a certain sect of Sufis. And he's actually buried in a Sufi cemetery, I believe. That's right. And that, yeah, and that, and, and, and those Sufis were kind of into this inversion already. They weren't following the traditional, you know, Islamic praying five times a day kind of stuff. They were breaking the dietary rules. They were breaking the sexual rules, anything that they could. So he's like, oh, these are kind of my buddies. I'll just chill with these guys. Right. And they seem to embrace, like, let's get even worse with our debauchery. The Sufis. Yes. Okay. That specific sect of Sufism. Okay, yeah. And we have to be clear, like, whenever we talk about any of this stuff, that... um there's an exoteric and an esoteric form of many things. And while Jacob Frank is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sabatai Zevi is uh, technically presented as Jewish, um, clearly if you look at the um, doctrine that he uh, practiced, um, that's not in line with you know 99% of the people that I know. Um, uh, that call themselves Jewish. So um, this is where things start to get complicated and I start to have issues with people like Ryan Dawson, um, who I like, I'm friends with, but um, he has a tendency to kind of like homo homogenize uh, things, which I, I don't think necessarily uh, always delivers the, uh, the most accurate uh, d dis description of what's going on. Uh, full disclosure, I was the I designed the online education system for the Shoah Foundation Institute, and the I, I consulted in on the digital online hate program for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. So I am hardly an anti-Semite. I am not. Uh, uh, I am not Jewish myself. I am half uh, Ashkenazi Jew, but I am. I am not a practicing Jew, and so uh, I don't. I, I don't want anybody to mistake any of the stuff that we're saying as anti-Semitic or anti-Jew. That's not what this no, is about. These yeah. guys were totally anti the Torah. That's the yeah. whole point. Right. They called themselves Jews, but they were anti-Torah because they practiced donma. Yes, donma. Which, which is to turn. And to be uh, specific about these Sufis, just so we have that, they were the Bektasi. The so Bektasi -E cult? T-A-S-T. H I and they said in the Sunni majority considers the Bektashi order and uh, the Elvis Amatonian lawless. So it is interesting that he chose to affiliate with them, Sabatai. So in right. many ways, they fall beyond the limits of acceptable Muslim behavior. Many of them do not follow the prescribed five daily prayers, preferring instead to offer their prayers privately or at Shem, the religious gathering place, nor do they adhere to fasting during Ramadan. They drink alcohol. They don't regard that as sinful and unlike the majority orthodox belief, they also emphasize the equality between men and women who may practice together their religion. So. Well, that's yeah. equality is hardly radical, though. No, I know. I know. But in Islam, it, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, in, in my notes, I wrote down uh, that I said that uh, Donma uh, is to pose as one culture when they're in a cult. So you, you're, you're posing. Well, it's going uh, undercover, I, right? I mean, it's, there's no the, different than a are spy. The, are the Yazidi kind of the same thing also? I think they're a little bit different. 
yeah than this but okay. i do believe that there is I, I don't know that they're connected but All i know right, that's something that uh pat's been looking into recently he brought up the yazidis with me the other day and i can't remember what the connection was well, maybe we can get him back when he's farther along in his book and he can explain okay. it all to us. Perfect. So uh, cut to, so he, so he disappears uh, into the uh, Sufi cemetery, right? <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, and, 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 his, and, and his legacy is this legacy of Donma, right? That, that, you, that, that if, if it's about uh, giving up your head, uh, don't give up your head, just you know, play along and then uh, uh, pretend to be a part of this other organization and then you can continue to practice what you want in secret. Right. I mean, um, it helps that your whole kind of uh, religious bent is to be debaucherous and, and duplicitous and lie. It's just like, all right, why not? Well, it's a good way to it's a good way to network with the party people, right? Sure. You know, so it's the wolf in sheep's clothing kind of deal. Well, but, but 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 people who are into bad things are in general in general they're more fun, right? I suppose. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I I'll get beaten up for that. Uh, leave, leave your comment below on how bad you think my sense of humor is. Uh, so uh, cut to uh, about eighty or eighty years later. So he um, dies in sixteen seventy six. Was it? I don't have it written down. And and this guy pops up uh, named Jacob Frank. And Jacob Frank contends that he is the reincarnation of Sabbatai Zevi. Um, and he isn't nearly as popular. But, you know, Andy Warhol said that if you want to be a successful artist, you should hang out with rich people. And so... Uh, Jacob Frank started hanging out with um, Meyer Rothschild and um, Adam Weissup and kind of became the spiritual leader uh, of the Illuminati, or so it seems. Um, yes, but here's, here's how... Uh... I don't know where he got this. He's citing this from something else. Zephyr says, although Jacob Frank was born 50 years after the death of Sabbatai Zevi, he deserves to be regarded as Sabbatai's true successor. He extended the paradoxical teachings of Zevi that the coming of the messianic age had transformed sexual prohibitions of the Bible into permissions and even obligations. Debauchery became therapy. Frank convinced his followers that the only way for their special form of Judaism to survive was for them to outwardly become Christians, just as the Doma had descended into the world of Islam. Right. And, and likewise, used the same methodology to take over uh, existing secret societies. So to infiltrate the Masons, to infiltrate the Rosicrucians, to in infiltrate, uh, you know, whatever society or organization or corporation that they needed to infiltrate in order to turn it to their own purposes. Correct. And he was right. born to a Sabbatean father, it says. Polish Sabbatean father. So it's a, so it's a generational thing. It's a bloodline thing? I guess so. <laughs> are, we back, are we are we back to bloodlines? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, so so that uh, you know, if if you subscribe to this hypothesis, then uh, it it explains a lot of things uh, in current current events. I mean, you had mentioned uh, Epstein, you know, the 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 behavior of people like Harvey Weinstein, uh, the uh, disappearance uh, apparent disappearance of children. Uh, the crazy mind control stories, uh, the Tracy Twyman, uh, uh, the things that Tracy Twyman describes in her books, the things that Kathy O'Brien describes in her books, those all kind of map uh, uh, conveniently into into this uh, theory. It to be kind of like a devil's advocate. Well, actually, to be if you're a devil's advocate. You're on their that, side. <laughs> I don't even know if that's right. So what would be the opposite of a devil's advocate? To be St. Peter's advocate, is that the... Yeah. Um, Peter is St. Peter's advocate. To uh, uh, to take the opposite side, though, the kind of ske skeptic, because I was listening to... Uh, who's the other Weissup, the guy with the podcast? Oh, um, 
uh, yeah, I can't remember what he calls Adam. Him. No, or Adam is the. There's Jacob. The Jacob. Jacob. It'll yeah, come think, to me in a minute. Anyway, I was listening to his podcast, and one of the things that he does on his podcast, and it kind of drives me crazy. And it's is, conspiracy theories and cu uh, pop culture or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yes, is that. Uh, you know, he puts it, he d has like the Tim Pool approach where he puts himself, he doesn't, he doesn't put himself out there and ever speculate. Um, he says, and, and I understand why you would do that, but just as a matter of course, what I like to do is I always like to question my wildest ideas and say, well, is there another way that I could be looking at that? Maybe I'm just completely smoking crack and, and I don't understand it. But, um, you know, there are great, you, you do have great unknowns when you've got the when you've got the Epstein of it all, and there's no information that becomes forthcoming, uh, and there's no explanations for things from authorities about why they did one thing and didn't do another, and what programs he was actually involved in and which ones that he wasn't. Then it kind of leaves it wide open for speculation, and so you you look at a lot of things like this and you think, well, that seems like it's more obvious. Uh, a more obvious explanation than all of the other explanations that you're coming up with. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how I look at this stuff. It's, you know, Ike is convinced. Ike is, you know, this is the reason he gets banned off of YouTube and stuff is that he's convinced of this stuff that, you know, he's seen enough of it that he's sure that that's what's happening. Uh, and he makes certainly makes a compelling case, but I don't see anybody on the opposite side making an equally... A compelling case that that's not what's going on. No, they just poo poo it. Well, that's crazy. But is right. it? We're talking about 1666 to 16. I think he died in the 1670s. But at one I, point in time, this guy had a million people following him. Yeah, that's not that's not uh, a slacker. No. There's, yeah. I, I don't even think there's a million Scientologists. I mean, we know how much work it takes just to get a hundred people to show up at to hold a sign up. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I, I mean, oh. it's an interesting pitch. Like, thank Isaac you, Weisler. super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, well, but like I said, it, it, it's it's like uh, I think of Pinocchio and uh, the uh, the fox and the cat that get him to go to the island where they're smoking cigars, and then everybody turns into a jackass. Um, it's easy if you're uh, offering kind of easy hedonism. Oh, here. Uh, you don't uh, have to be a good person. Yeah. Right. It's hard. It's hard to be good. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. takes discipline and yeah. strength and, you know, um, not succumbing to temptation. So that that's, I don't know. I think it's way more difficult to try to stay on the, the good path than it is to just be like, screw it. Yep. Yeah. So the mobsterful. Or is it themo burstable? I, I I always have a problem with that. The mobsterful. The mobsterful. That's what, how I would. Says it. that the theory ma matches up with a lot of metadata. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's I guess that's the point, right? Yeah. That right. when more George Webb likes to talk about uh, his old uh, Miami of Ohio business school, uh, uh, when he used to map things out on a cork board with uh, pictures and pins and yarn, and when you've got when you've got different colors of yarn going between the same three pins, uh, you know, over and over, you've got eight strands of yarn going between the same three pins, you start to realize, okay, well, there's a some kind of a correlation going on here between uh, this information and that information. So this all seems to map. Um, yeah. And in a lot of ways, it would explain, I mean, uh, probably what we could say for a second hour, if we want to do that on a second hour, is how this stuff maps to things like the transfer agreement, um, you know, all, a.k.a. the Havari, Havari agreement, which you can, it's got a Wikipedia page, you can go read about it yourself. If we talk about it too much here on YouTube, we will get banned. Um, but the idea that this, all of this stuff kind of uh, uh, transitions into uh, actions uh, in, you know, post 1776 so you've got you know the french revolution and then the uh, american revolution or the american revolution and the french revolution um and then world war one the creation of the um council uh, on foreign relations council on foreign relations the uh federal reserve bank and then uh adolf hitler comes to power and there seems to be you know um Sefer points out that there 
you know, was coordination between uh, uh, the Third Reich and and the Zion, the original Zion, Zionists. So, um, uh, and that's all. Which third... are these guys? Excuse me. The the original Zionists that you're talking about are these Sabbatean Frankists. Yeah, they're Sabbatean Frankists, right? Cause... And they want Israel back. Because they want to build the temple, they want to rebuild the temple, and they want to make they want to make Israel the capital of the planet, um, because it's uh, scriptural. Yes, they're they're trying to bring about prophecy right. by lining stuff up. They think if they do that, then you're building the runway, and the plane will land. Correct. If we build it, he will come. Yeah, starring Kevin Costner. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> the field of dreams, right? Yeah. Or the field of prophecy, as it were. So, um, so yeah. So there, there is kind of a direct line, uh, a thread, as it were, a piece of yarn, as George would say, um, that you can draw between Sabbatai Zevi and you know current events, things that are going on right now. And um, uh, if true, uh, it certainly makes things a lot easier to understand. Like when you're looking at current events and you're looking at people and you're trying to understand what their motivations are, why they're doing things. Um, and that's that, that said, um, I think that all of these organizations are uh, small, tight, and compartmentalized. And a lot of people may be doing things that other people don't know about. Um, and, and that's part of the way that they maintain their secrecy. I agree, Peter. Okay. <laughs> All right, should we take questions now? Sure, I mean, we, we got a ton of comments that we've just let fly by this whole time. Okay, yeah, let's take a look at them. You want to click or you want me to click? I don't know. Should we go back to the beginning? I, don't, I see I see one here. It says uh, somebody needs to read Dragon Legacy. Yeah, Dragon Legacy uh, is on my list. In fact, I think you and I have that book because it's Nicholas in Nicholas the... DeVere. Right? Yeah, that was the one that Twyman helped with? She edited the book, and I think it's in that Twyman archive uh, that you and I have. Um, remember right. the remember yeah. the Dropbox Twyman archive mm -hmm. that you found? Oh, yeah. yeah. I look so, at it all the time. Yep. So I think it's in there. What is I it? Oh, know. did I say that? Okay. I don't I know what's dangerous. I don't know. Um, I clicked on the wrong thing. That's right. All right. From the stuff I heard in the shared video. The constant lying and deception of the Sabbateans stood out more than the evilness. I don't know. I mean, it, it was interesting to dig through and try to find people that were sharing more of what his actual teachings were. That was really difficult to get to. People just kind of gloss it over and say this was, you know, the overarching idea. Right. And when you read a lot of this stuff, it seems like it's been cut and pasted from one author to the next. Like they're all making very similar claims in almost exactly the same language. Yes. Right. Well, we're not talking about the Bible specifically. We're talking about the Torah and we're talking about this Lorian Kabbalah and the Talmud and the and Talmud. the, and, the yeah. and the Zohar. So, the Zohar. yeah. And so I think that the, the way that I got the litany was that, uh, uh, the Torah is the old school and then the Talmud came out of Babylon. Uh, and was <clears throat> and was the um, the doctrine of the Sabbateans, um, and then, uh, according to Billy Phillips, the uh, Tracy's favorite person, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Zohar is the written version of something that had been an oral tradition until the Kabbalists were afraid that it was going to get lost because there weren't enough of them. And so they wrote it down. Um, at least that's the way that I, it was explained and I understood it. So if somebody knows better than me, let me know. Um, where are we? Uh, figure it out from Fort. It, it seems to be this uh, Rabbi Marvin Antelman that I talked about that has these two books called to eliminate the opiate he dug through to find original source material i believe and he got attacked in 74 when his first book came out about this stuff because this was a story that they seemed to want to bury what this guy was all about because he got a million followers 
That's the rabbi. Kind of hard to, yeah, no, Sab, it's Sabbatized uh, Sa- Evi. Right, yeah, he got a million followers. He got a lot of people following him, so it's kind of a, a, a not attractive part of the history of Judaism that they'd kind of like to exercise from the history books. And they did excommunicate him. Like, nobody wants anything to do with him. But it, it's it's covered up pretty seriously. I mean, and, and when, if you think about it, like a million follower, when you, you think about having a million followers on Twitter, and that's a lot. And there's 7 billion people on the planet now. And so I don't know how many people <laughs> were on but the planet imagine back then. Amassing a million followers in a time when the printing press was the hot new technology. Uh-huh. So how long does it take you to get that word out and then get people get it accepted? It's not like they had some means of having a huge advertising campaign. And nothing that I read talked about them sending out people to proselytize or anything like that or spread this word. It seems to have spread as organically as possible. Just that there's nothing that tells me how it got to to that. Yeah, and that would be an, that would be a really interesting thing to find out because if you know, you were tying it to the printing press. If it does have something to do with something that was being printed at the time, um, that would make sense. But, uh, man, those books would be a collector's item, I suppose. Right. Well, and he the, was saying that the Lurian Kabbalah was being printed and that people right. were reading that. So Zevi kind of grafted his story onto the, the Lurian interpretation of right. the Kabbalah. And that's that's how he explained it so we've we've kind of given it a nice clean spin and just said yep they're just doing everything that's bad there's a little bit deeper to the whole theory behind everything yeah and we're doing that so we don't get kicked off youtube (laughs) right well i'm also doing because i don't want to read all the stuff like this is what they thought there were these things and you know 10 it almost sounds like they had a, a version of the tree of life with the sephira and that God filled those or tried to fill them with these divine essences and then they broke. Mm-hmm. And so those were scattered all over the place. So Zevi was like, well, some of them went into the darkness, meaning the evil debauched areas. So we have to go to the darkness to find those sparks. Right. That's the, the Cliff Notes version of how he used the, the Lorianic um, Kabbalah to justify his debauchery. Right. And, you know, not unlike other uh organizations i i mean i don't i don't believe that all kabbalists are mm-hmm. are are satanic and believe in sabbatean frankism uh but the sabbatean frankists uh used kabbalah a, as you're talking to as an explanation for why they do some of the things that they do do right and but then I when th- they became the doma they i'm sure they found reasons to that it, that Islam could also work, and mm-hmm. then they infiltrated the Christian Church, right through the Jesuits. Yes, yeah. so they're going to use whatever religion to justify it. They'll just graft this onto it, and they seem like very practiced liars and decent salesmen. A million followers—that's huge. <laughs> I'm serious. You're like, like people are getting around on horseback. Yeah, I know. It's it's yeah. uh... <laughs> if you live back then, maybe you meet two hundred people. I mean, it seemed it, it's and it was probably like uh, 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 territorial, right? Because you know, you didn't have you didn't have telephones. You didn't. It was all most ninety nine percent word of mouth, right? Right. Because even if you had books, most people didn't read. Yeah, uh, but if you look at you know, Jacob Frank comes out of Poland. So we're talking about a guy that was running around the Middle East spreading this, never made it as far as I could tell north of, of there, never made it up into Northern Europe. And Sabata, or, uh, Jacob Frank is born to a Sabbatean father in Poland. That's how far this got. So well, it's no if you, joke. Well, if Th- Thermomstable is correct, then that, you know, it's half of uh, the Jews in the world had, were, were practicing some form of this at that point. And a lot of them abandoned it when he converted. But it seems like the powerful picked it up when you've got Jacob Frank allying with the, with the Rothschild and, and Weissop. Right. Yeah. So how are these barefoot people getting this word out? I mean, maybe the rabbis in different places were communicating with each other and that's how it spread because they did talk about these rabbis having dreams where Zevi would come to them. So that made me start thinking... 
was his photograph or a likeness of him printed and shared about. Right. And you've got icons of him because there's more than one. The drawing that's on that Wikipedia page is just one. There's several drawings that I found of him. This picture? Yes. That says that was from 1906. Interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> Welcome to the club, Jenny. That's right. Peter has his own pitchfork, so he yeah. can he can match them. My pitchfork's right there. Okay, what was the? Seems we Oh, I don't know what they're talking about now. Shoes were for winter. That makes sense. Hmm. Amber Road, Greece to St. Petersburg. I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not sure I understand it either. But I do think this is an interesting thread that we've got to keep pulling on for a while to see where else it leads. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I, I bought this Ike book probably over a year ago and I, I've read, uh, you know, a couple of dozen pages you know, prepping for this video today, but I, I, I need to go back and take a look at it. It actually reads pretty quickly. I'm, I'm, you give me a book that's this thick, like, it seems daunting. I, 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 I go in, I go into co cognitive dissonance, you know, it's oh. like, I, that's what um, Underdown's talking about ancient trading route that would explain how you could contact a million people. Oh, well, you mean, you mean like the belt and road, Dave, <laughs> like the new belt and road. Um, yeah, you got to wonder because that does that just become this whisper down the lane kind of thing, which then how, you know, how does that turn out? Right. You know, and I, I, I was, being it was funny because I pulled the Ike book off the off the shelf and then I realized it's not any it's not much thicker than Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Mm -hmm. This is a version of Seven Pillars of Wisdom with my photograph on the cover of the rock formation called Seven Pillars of Wisdom in Wadi Rum and Jordan. Um, and it was, I picked it up because um, uh, one of the guys who helped T.E. Lawrence uh, was a guy named Auda. And I thought his name was Auda uh, Sabutai. And when I was reading all this Sabutai stuff, but his name isn't. It's Auda, Auda, Auda Abutai. Abutai, not Sabutai. And so I didn't want to make the Hamamoto Yamamoto mistake. Mm -hmm that I made with Dr. Hamamoto. Um, so I, I, I'm not claiming that he has anything to do with it. So. <laughs> okay. It's a cool story, Peter. It, yeah, it's a cool story. And, uh, there are mobsters trying to tell me that Poland is not that far from Turkey. It is when your only mode of transportation is walking or horses. It's pretty damn far. There, there might be rivers. Are there rivers that can, the Danube or something get, get you close? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, but I would, I would like to find out how the, the word spread. Yeah, this is one of those things like, uh, uh, there's a, John Keegan, uh, is a author who writes, uh, military history books, uh, but he writes them from the first person perspective. That is what it's like to actually be a soldier at the battle of Waterloo or Agincourt or in the battle of the Somme. And it would be a John Keegan style history that would explain how you would actually get from uh, Anatolia, is it Anatolia? Mm -hmm. to Western Anatolia. Western yeah. Anatolia to Poland in 17, well, it's probably easier in 1700 than 1600, but. Yeah. Um, yes, I find that odd too. Uh, wait to marijuana cultivators. Well, they were, he was growing hemp. Um, one of the things they're not the same thing, same yeah, family of plants. Yeah. I mean, the, the colonial Congress mandated that, uh, American farmers, uh,
plant a certain amount percentage of their fields with hemp because the uh, uh, United States Navy needed rope. When it, there's an old uh, cliche about smoking a joint, uh, which is uh, burning some rope. Um, and that comes from that. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I know that Washington grew hemp. I don't know if he grew marijuana necessarily, but I maybe. Don't, I don't believe so. But hemp is a really useful plant. Yeah. The stuffing on Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz upholstery in their cars is all hemp. Interesting. Because mm -hmm. they're allowed to grow it over there? Because they never got stupid about it. Uh, the, the story that I heard about about uh, marijuana becoming illegal was that uh, William Randolph Hearst bought all of the forests in the Northwest and he financed movies like Reefer, Reefer Madness in order to criminalize uh, uh, hemp growing in the United States because that would force all paper products to be made out of trees uh, because before that uh, there was a the lion's share of uh, paper was being made out of um, renewable weeds uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to trees that take years to grow. Well, um, imagine it, if we were growing it now, we wouldn't have a lumber shortage. Well, maybe that's the point. Maybe they, they want to bring it back again. I, I'm not sure. Well, they've made it legal in certain states. I think you might even be Pennsylvania might even. Well, be and they're trying, and they're they're doing everything they can to stomp out tobacco. And it uh, it turns out that uh, hemp actually is a better cash crop than tobacco. So if you converted all of the tobacco farms in Virginia, for example, to growing hemp, industrial hemp, not weed, uh, then you. would be able to make paper and you'd be able to do all kinds of uh, things with it. That hemp is very useful. It's a useful plant. All right. So Jenny's trying to say that Adam Weishaupt and George Washington were the same person. Yeah, I've seen this. I've, I've seen this. Uh, it seems I, I, I'm not, a little far-fetched. This theory came from the Illuminist Trilogy, a 1970s fiction book, uh, predictive programming. Yeah, I... There, I, I've read uh, that debunked. There's a lot of um, Adam Weisup and George Washington uh, were in different places at the same time. And that, so that's a hard trick to pull off. Yes. And I think that Illuminous Trilogy was part of Operation Mind F that was done to purpose. Oh, Operation Mind F, which was, uh, which was a PSYOP. Right? Anton Wilson, yeah. It was yeah. an open PSYOP. Right. Yes. In which everything is related to the Illuminati. <laughs> so that just makes us all look crazy when we talk about them and say, hey, they were a real thing. Like they. Right. And that's why. Yeah. That's what I call the cat poop su sushi. Uh, yeah. uh, disinformation approach. Exactly. It's like, you know, I how do you how do you how do you take child pedophile rings and make them uh, look ridiculous, you create Pizzagate or you create, how do you take, uh, you know, all of the other nonsense that was going on, you, you create QAnon and then you just mix a little shit in it every once in a while. And then people will point at the smelly shit and they'll go oh, that all of the stuff that you're, you're talking about is wrong because that one thing that you were talking about didn't happen. It's a good strategy. It works. It, it seems to work. It makes things disappear away from the news. So there's no refactoring, right? There's no. Uh, no. But for the news media, it works for them all the time. They, they can slip in shit whenever they want to. And make huge mistakes and never go back. And and not. Uh, and not fix their damn mistakes. No, no, no. No, they just leave the poop in the sushi. Right, exactly. And keep feeding it to you. And, and keep getting that bad expression on your face when you bite into it. Um, 2019 was the year of hemp here in Oregon. Millions and millions of plants, literally miles of hemp were planted that year. It's probably when a bunch of the growers of real of weed figured out that they had an overabundance of supply because the prices there plummeted like crazy. And it became unprofitable to be a weed farmer because so many people became weed farmers. So if you're all set up to farm, it's like, okay, what, well, what else can we do here? And I think hemp is probably a way easier to grow. Uh, yeah, yeah, add water. Yeah. It's a weed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes. And what's this? What is he saying? And you can turn Stinky Flynn into a hero. Yeah, the, the, we're still open to. Yeah, I'm still open on on Flynn. There's good things to say about him and bad things to say about him. Um, he he hasn't explained that Bijan Kian, the nonsense that he was dealing with that he got in trouble for uh, adequately to me. But, um, uh, you know, his actions are good, I guess, if it, unless you chalk it up to the keeping everybody distracted uh, meme, which is also something that you could apply to him. I'm not sure. I wish I, I, wish I could be sure. I, when I stood on stage with him in uh, December... Uh, and took his picture and I was about eight or nine feet away from him and the president flew over in the helicopter and he pointed up and smiled and I, I, I pushed the button and I thought, you know, that's the first time I've seen that guy smile in four years. Um, and I really thought, I really felt at that moment that something really was going to change. There was something really going on that was going to turn that election around. Um, and uh, it was his smile that made me believe it. So uh, the jury's still out on, on Flynn for me. Um, I want to believe him. I just don't. I, I want to know what happened with Bijan Kian and the Turks well, and what was, what was really going on there. What's he got? Sharing water is sacred. Mm-hmm. I think we're jumping into a conversation that's ongoing. Okay. Yes. It. One of the problems with con with comments. Right. Like How to counter the strategy of deception. Hmm. Yeah, infiltrate and corrupt. That seems to be the strategy. It's the uh, you infiltrate the news and you corrupt it. You infiltrate an organization, you corrupt it. Infiltrate and corrupt. You don't create your own organization. You find other organizations and you make them your own. Um, that seems to be the ongoing uh, strategy here, whether it's the FBI and the CIA. I, mean, I don't right, think. Right, but how, he's saying, how do you counter that? That's the question. Uh, you counter it by re refactoring the facts until you get a story that makes sense. And if there's one fact in, and in, the, the way I, that I like to think about it is that you'll you'll have an entire narrative and then somebody p will pick out one fact that doesn't make any sense uh, or is wrong and then they will throw out the other 99 facts that you've come up with because the one fact that you've come up with is the cat poop sushi, right? Mm -hmm. So then you have to refactor it. You just have to own it. You have to say, okay, well, that was wrong, but that doesn't make the other 99 things here that we're dealing with wrong. And I, I see that right now going on and on with the, with the, uh, the, the jabbies and the... Uh, the virus going around is that, you know, people will find one thing. I, you know, I, I downloaded a document. I'm on a telegram thread and somebody put together a document that documents the 55 people that have died of, uh, uh, since they had uh, vaccinations in the United States. And I, you know, involuntarily, I just find myself highlighting the name and then throwing it into the search engine to vi validate every single name that's in there to make sure that, um, there isn't one, you know, because I'm not going to actually pass that on to anybody until I've, I've fact checked it and made sure of everything. Um, and that's why having sources that, you know, are doing those things is really important. Um, there's a tendency, uh, I have one friend on Instagram who just seems to like repost everything that feeds her bias, anything that somebody says, uh, that matches what she already believes she you know, fires and forgets. She doesn't go and check it. Um, Twitter has got this function now where they, some, you'll see an article, uh, and if you go to retweet it, um, it says, do you want to read the article first? You know, a lot of times I've already read the article, and that's why I'm retweeting it. Um, uh, a lot of times I'm retweeting it because it's coming from a source that is a personal friend of mine or somebody that I know well. Um, and so I, I have an assumption that... Uh, that they fact checked it, but you know, that's veracity seems to be the missing uh, 
uh, item in all news right now. Um, uh, you know, you, 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 you do have to double check everything because the things that you used to be able to take for granted, you can't take for granted anymore. Right. But is that how you beat this thing? I mean, that seems like small actions. I think something on a larger scale, I don't know if you saw that O'Keefe announced that he's created that whole legal fund now to protect people that are being defamed by media outlets. And I think that could be huge. Yeah, I mean, you just need an, a, a couple of more Hulk Hogan decisions, right? And 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 you're gonna and you're gonna create a situation where it's gonna become untenable uh, for them to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that George Soros doesn't come up with his own fund, um, because sure. But if the know, media sites have lost credibility by losing these big things, and they have to admit really embarrassing stuff in court, and while we are building an alternative media, which just keeps growing, and they mm -hmm. can't play whack a mole anymore. I was telling Peter before we went live, Rumble now has live streaming. They want you to pay a heck of a lot for it, but there is an option and there's more options coming online. I'm told uh, locals will have live streaming within the next couple of months as well. So the, the monopoly is losing its grip. Yeah, and it's and, the, and that has to happen. But, you know, th we're in a race right now, I think. And the race is to see if they can get a majority of people vaccinated because then they can uh, bring in their digital vaccine passport. Um, and if they do that, then they can basically use m medicine, uh, you know, uh, Biden's, uh, medical DARPA initiative to, to control society in an extra constitutional way and, and make people do what they want them to do, regardless of what the news is. Um, I, I don't think it's going to get that far, Peter. I think they're having a really hard time cracking the 50%. And even though they think they can um, put this burden on enforcement on private industry, there's no way that certain industries are going to be willing to lose 50% of their customers, if not more. Right. Okay. Well, I got a, uh, uh, emer uh, you know how there's an emergency uh, notification system built into your phone? Mm -hmm. And so the emergency notification system went off in Los Angeles yesterday. Everyone's cell phone went bang. At the same time, everybody jumps up and grabs their phone, and it's the Los Angeles County Health Department announcing that uh, they are now providing vaccines for free to anybody who wants them. Yeah. So you, they're using the emergency notification network in That's order. That's how bad it is. Yeah. So, so to your point, that probably indicates that they're doing everything they possibly can in order to uh, get people vaccinated. There, but, there was an article in Politico maybe two weeks ago that was saying people aren't, you know, they've reached the point where they've basically vaccinated everybody that was dying to get vaccinated. And now they're having trouble in the White House. The White House isn't worried, but they're looking into using celebrities and other people to push this idea of getting vaccinated on everybody else. And they're allocating money to do it, but they're not worried. They think enough people will get on board. And it's just, I, I don't know. There was somebody, um, Every time I sign, get on Twitter on my phone, it's like, do you want to look at the Pennsylvania COVID updates? I'm like, not really, but I do because I like to see how much they're getting spread about and what the comments are underneath them. And somebody, um, I don't know if it was the Pennsylvania Health Department or the Philadelphia Health Department, tweeted out a photo a couple of days ago and it was saying, hey, the Philadelphia Convention Center has tons of appointments available for vaccinations. And it had a picture and it's just this room with chair, rows of chairs lined up to get people vaccinated. And it's empty and i thought wow they got everybody that they're going to get and now it's going to be what's going to be the pressure game that comes into being on all of this well i want that to be true um so it feeds my confirmation bias um <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, they went nuts over Rogan saying there's no reason for a healthy 21 year old to get vaccinated. Well, there isn't. And, you know, I'm having an ongoing uh, argument with my daughter uh, who wants who wants to get vaccinated. My my ex-wife got her second shot two days ago and she's been in bed sick ever since. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I I hope she is going to do well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a puzzling one. The Gateses. The Gates. There's some really funny memes. So. 
Yes, there are. Very funny. What was the, I wish we would have grabbed them. What was the best one that you saw? Did anything come to mind? Um, Bill sitting in front of a computer and uh, write, writing his Tinder profile. Not the one that Luke had, but that was okay. his profile, but there was one. And he, he said, <laughs> looking for a young, I think young, beautiful, and lots of blood, something like that. <laughs> uh, any, uh, anyway. I, the, the one that I liked the most was him sitting at a computer, putting up a profile on somewhere. And it was like looking for young, young vaccinated women. And, and then they had this little panel underneath with pictures of four different women who were wearing sleeveless. And all of a sudden there's like something beaming off of their arm. Like it's turned on <laughs> their chip. <laughs> it's like, that's what this was all about. And he's right. Divorce does protect assets. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not exactly sure, but how that works. Um, but I have a video that I saw on Twitter. I don't think, I don't know if, the sound will play, but um, if we don't have any other questions, I thought we could play it on our outro. All right. Watch. I'm down. Uh, Is it going to get us in more trouble than anything we've said on the show? Uh, no, it's just a, it's a, it's a funny video of people um, wear, wearing masks in a, um, in a store. Not wearing uh, masks or wearing masks? No, they're wearing masks in a store, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's not what you would normally ex expect. So I'm All gonna... right. Well, while you pull that up, I'll remind everybody. I'll put links to a lot of the YouTube videos that Peter and I watched to prep for this into uh, the show notes and the link to Robert Seffer's book, which is a quick read. And he's got a couple of videos, too, going over the Sabatian Frankist history. Yeah, I was talking to Dr. Hamamoto about that last night about for, about Suffer, and he was going, "Oh, he's a plagiarist." And I and I, I I pointed out to him that when I was in college, I would regularly take classes where the professor would lecture for twenty minutes or half an hour, and then play a video, and then after the video was over, then we would all talk about the 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 video because the video was in reference to whatever the lecture was. And so when I watch Suffer's things, I understand that he's using other people's material a lot, but. Uh, it's not without reference. Right. Um, he cites it. And this yeah. book is not very long. It's only, I think, 60 something pages. Yeah. But then it's 20 pages of references. Yeah. It's a good book. I like yeah. it. It's, it's, it's a good overview. It's, it's, it's a lot less intimidating than that brick. <laughs> than this. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll cover in a couple months because my copy's coming on Sunday. All right. Or Saturday. Well, let me uh, find this video then. And, uh, I'll just play it here. Let me see if is there. A... I can hear it. <laughs> so you see, it but looks, it looks like, like they're wearing masks under those masks. Well, one one person is, but it looks like about fifteen or twenty people just showed up in a supermarket, and they are. Uh, they're, they're going, bah, bah, and everybody's wearing a mask. This is what norm, more more people need to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Get your sheet mask, people. Just get 50 of them. Get some friends and go to the store and just torture people. You're not breaking any laws. You're just making fun of people. Humor is a really good attack vector. Yeah, this is like our answer to the shame mobs. Exactly. All right, uh, like and subscribe, everybody. We'll see you later.